My name is Tyrone Hayes. I'm a professor of integrative biology at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, at the University of California, Berkeley, I teach a course in human endocrinology, so the study of hormones in, in humans. And my research focuses on the role of hormones in development with a particular focus in reproduction. And I primarily conduct research on amphibians and I study pesticides and other envir environmental contaminants that interfere with hormone action, that interfere with development and reproduction. I, I grew up with an appreciation for nature and a, a love of nature. And by nature, I mean everything that's in it. That includes, um, not to be cliche, but the sky and the seas and the trees and the animals and the people that share this world with the plants and animals that live in it. Uh, my philosophy is, again, not to sound cliche, but my philosophy is do no harm. And that um, is, uh, governs my interactions and relationships with people, as well as my interactions and relationships with the world around me. My research, um, even though it's uh, primarily curiosity driven, so I, you know, I desire to answer questions about how things work and how plants and animals get along, as well as how all of our parts within our body, uh, how, how, how they get along. But my research primarily is also driven to understand things that we've done. So for example, pesticide contaminants or deforestation or things associated with climate change to understand how those things are negatively impacting our planet and how we might go about slowing the damage um, because there's no way to reverse or fix much of the damage that we've done. But how can we go about slowing the damage so that we have a livable world to offer to our future generations. What, what I think is most important, I, so I, I, I'm a scientist, so I'm an academically trained scientist, and I do things that, are, that reflect my training for how I uh, formulate hypotheses and how I address uh, questions, not just about climate change, but about any type of biology or anything that's happening in the world. With regards to climate change, as well as the other global changes that we've made on the planet that are affecting our lives and all of the lives on the planet, I think the most important thing that I've learned was summed up by a conference that I attended uh, called, uh, it was called Presbyterians for the Earth. And the philosophy that was expressed at that conference was that the creator or whoever you believe in spiritually has left us this planet to be stewards of, to take care of. And, and so the idea was that we have to understand the science and understand what we've done to understand how to address the problems that we've created. And the most important thing I learned from that conference was the, the idea that we can't fix anything, but we can stop it from getting worse. And I think that's what we've learned from my ac academic science background. That's what I've learned. We can't fix extinction. Once species are gone, they're gone. But we can do everything we can to stop it from increasing. We can't fix, you know, I study environmental chemical contaminants in the environment. We can't fix it. We've created chemicals that are so good at what they do, like DDT and other pesticides, that they will be here forever. So the best we can do is to stop putting more of those chemicals into the environment. We can't get rid of the ones, very, at least with the scientific technology that we have now, we can't very easily get rid of the ones that we've put there. And the same goes for climate change. We can't fix it. Even if we stop everything we were doing now, even if we stop carbon emissions, it will continue to occur. But what we can do is we can stop it from getting worse. And I think that's the philosophy that, that we have to have. It's, it's something that, uh, a, philo a similar philosophy that I've had in my own life. Like I would always, every, at the end of every academic year, I would be down on myself because I didn't teach this properly or I didn't say this properly. And, and it took me a long time to realize that no matter how hard you try, you will never be perfect. And so we have to, we have to learn to settle for momentary, momentary excellence.
And I think the same idea is that we would never fix the planet. We will never fix all of the things we've done, but we have to do our best to stop making it worse. And, and I think some, some people say that sounds pessimistic, but I think that's actually optimistic and it's actually realistic, right? Because if you think I'm gonna fix this, I'm gonna take the planet back to the way it was 100 years ago, that's not possible. But we can stop it from going down this trajectory of getting worse. Chronology. I, as a professional, I seek to try to understand how, in particular, I focus on amphibians, but in general, I want to understand how animals work. And by that, I mean, in the case of frogs, for example, when they metamorphose, several things happen, right? The tail goes away and it grows legs. And in a very simple way, I want to understand how does the tail know what the legs are doing? It has to be coordinated properly. For, for, so, for example, if the tail goes away before the legs are developed, then you have a round ball that can't move. And I wanted to understand how those parts are coordinated. And it turns out that hormones coordinate those parts. I also wanted to understand how the animal coordinates those changes with the environment. So for example, if you turn into a frog, if you metamorphose too early, then you're too small and you can't catch food and eat. If you metamorphose too late, then the pond might dry up and you'll die before you get the chance to metamorphose. And it turns out that that coordination of those developmental changes with the environment is also controlled by hormones. I accidentally got thrown into this whole field of endocrine disruption because I discovered that there are chemicals, human-made chemicals that we put into the environment that interfere with those hormones. That means that you have inappropriate development happening at inappropriate times. You might think of cancers the same way. Cancers, right, it's our own bodies growing out of control. It's a lack of coordination, a lack of appropriate regulation. It's cells that, that normally should stop growing and they continue to grow and they don't know when to stop growing and or they grow at the wrong time in the wrong place. And many cancers, as you might know, are also affected by many of the same chemicals that are affecting frog hormones. I, I got involved in studying a chemical called atrazine because under a mandate from the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, Novartis, a pharmaceutical company at the time that also produced agrochemicals, uh, was charged by the government, by the regulatory processes in the government, to study atrazine, their number one pesticide, an herbicide, a weed killer. And it turns out that this pesticide interferes with development by inducing inappropriate estrogen production in animals. The result in frogs is that genetically male frogs that should have testis develop ovaries. They completely turn into females. Um, and this is significant because atrazine is, is globally distributed. It's the number one selling, uh, number one pesticide contaminant. Sorry, it's the number one selling pesticide in the world. Uh, and the number one pesticide contaminant, uh, contaminating groundwater, surface water, and drinking water. Sorry, let me correct that. At the time that I was studying atrazine, it was the number one selling agrochemical in the world. It's now been replaced by Roundup. Atrazine is still, however, the number one contaminant of drinking water, rainwater, groundwater in the world. And so here we have an endocrine disrupting compound that turns genetically male frogs into female frogs and does the same thing in many, many animals that have been, been studied. And by the same mechanism, inappropriate production of estrogen is associated with breast cancer and prostate cancer in humans. Um, this becomes a global problem. And atrazine is but one chemical that we know that acts as the so-called endocrine disruptor and causes these types of problems in wildlife and in humans you know, just completely recognize now that it's, uh, the number I've heard from experts in the field is that less than 30% of cancer can be explained by genetics, that the rest is all, and part of the confusion has been that cancer might run in families. That doesn't necessarily mean it's genetic, right? Because it also means that the family's been living in the same place and exposed to the same oh. chemicals. And even if you move away, you're carrying those chemicals with you in your body and or your body's been altered in ways that you pass these things down to your offspring. Even though it's not a genetic mutation or a gene, you can pass these effects down for multiple generations. And, you know, we're just in the last decade beginning to understand that. So things, even things that may have looked genetic because they ran in families, 
we now know has a huge environmental component. We don't know, but even a lot of, quote, genetic diseases. I mean, they're, they're environmental, you know, right? there's a genetic component to diabetes, right? But diabetes has a lot to do with, you know, our diet and exercise and all these other things that go around it. So just because you, even if there is a genetic component, doesn't mean that you're condemned to um, that particular condition or disease because there, there are other factors that exacerbate or determine whether or not it's expressed. The other funny, the, not funny, but the other interesting thing I'll say in regard to, and I, and I have complete respect for medical doctors. I'm not being disrespectful. But I remember once I was at a friend's house and um, it's a Harvard educated medical doctor. And uh, uh, they had, the couple had cats and they had released the cats and the cats were out playing in the yard. And, and then the wife who was the medical doctor said, oh, you, I hope you didn't let the cats out. We just sprayed the lawn. And I remember I looked at her and I said, your kids are outside playing on the lawn. And you released the cat. And she said, I never thought about it. And, you know, and I think people don't make that connection that, that you know, your, your cats and we are breathing and taking in, especially little kids and they're putting things in their mouths. And, you know, this was a medical doctor who just said, oh my God, I never thought about it that way. Well, I mean, and one of the, you know, if there's anything positive, about COVID, um, I've seen so many people now gardening and now learning how to preserve foods. And, and, and I, I don't know about there, but around California, everybody's been sharing their sourdough starter and learning how to make bread again. And, and um, I think the idea of, and we have, my wife and I, up until the drought hit in California, when our kids were here, we grew 90% of, of our own vegetables. And um, and also just for me, I loved it as a biologist of watching things grow and figuring out how to make things grow. But just if you're not growing yourself, um, buying locally and appreciating local growers who grow organic and who don't use pesticides, I think it's incredibly important. And again, if anything's been positive out of COVID, that's one of the things that I've just been, you know, I, all over social media, everybody's posting their sourdough bread and everybody's posting their tomatoes that they grew in. Why haven't we been doing this all along? And one of the things that's also driven me crazy is is lawns and the, and the you know using water to grow grass and to and the, all the, the chemicals that are used to make a beautiful lawn. Why not grow something there that we can eat or something that we can use for you know medicinal purposes, medicinal plants, and um, you know so so that's one of the things that I think is incredibly important and that I wish that we could I wish that we could do. Um, because it, it impacts everything from, you know, climate issues to reduced pesticide use to wasted water on lawns, just, just to be honest. Um, and so that's important. Thinking more about conserving water. Um, and even in my own home, I can think of ways that, that we waste water. And there, but there are laws in the area that I live in California against certain types of gray water systems. Right. And, and, and I wish that we had better systems for that. I wish that there were more places that gave breaks for financial breaks for people to install solar, um, not only as an efficient source of energy, but to get away from fossil fuels and, and from some of the other detrimental ways that we impact the environment by, you know, burning fossil fuels or, or you know, burning coal and things like that. Um, those are, those are, I think, the big things. Or even thinking more about how we interact with our own health. I mean, since we're talking about COVID-19, about precautions that we take, not just to protect ourselves, but to protect others, to protect more vulnerable people. Um, I, wish, I wish, you know, my fear is that once the COVID-19 protocol is over, that everybody will go back to the way that they had been doing things before. And I really hope that that's not the case. I really hope that we've learned lessons about how we can protect ourselves and protect the environment that, that will continue when there's not a crisis. Um, likewise, you know, a related topic, I've seen lots of action on my campus about the racial climate and about the um, treatment of, of people from the LBTQ community. And there's, you know, heightened awareness. And I hope that after this is all over that people remember and that people remember to try to work towards a more, co more cohesive and peaceful and accepting and inclusive environment. 
you know, one of the things that the company, one of their initial defenses was they argued that, oh, it was just me and my frogs that, you know, that I had done some experiment wrong. And, and, and that even if I was right, it was just one species. But now we, we clearly see that this effect occurs in multiple species of frogs. But now there's a cohort of scientists around the world who have shown similar effects in amphibians, in fish, in reptiles, in birds, in mammals, and also the cancer-related effects of atrazine in humans. So it's very clear, and that the unifying theme is the mechanism that we, you know, fish produce estrogen and make estrogen and depend on estrogen for reproduction the same way that humans do. And so if you have a chemical that's affecting fish and frogs, of course it's going to affect humans. In fact, I just saw a paper, it wasn't on atrazine, but I just saw a scientific study uh, recently where they took chemical contaminants that were found in amniotic fluid, the human fetus, and they took those same chemicals and they raised frogs in them and they showed that it caused neural damage, retarded you know, central nervous system development in frogs. And so here you've taken an environment, you've simulated the environment that fetuses develop in and, and shown that now fish can't survive or you know have difficulty surviving and developing properly in a chemical mixture that's found in the amniotic fluid around the fetus. And so those kinds of connections, that kind of oneness, you know, I've often talked about the oneness between environmental health and public health. They're not two different things at all. We just have this, as humans somehow, we have this illusion in our head that somehow we're protected from the environment or we're different. There's nature and then there's us, right? When I, like the, the example I just gave you of the doctor who recognizes that her cat shouldn't be on the lawn but didn't think about the fact that her kids were playing on the same lawn. And, and I think, I think we're, we're gradually now getting past that arrogance that somehow we're above all the other animals and plants that we think that we control in the world. So yes, I think there's a broader recognition now that it's not just frogs. frogs. Frogs might be more sensitive and frogs might be more obvious because we're paying attention, but it's not just the frogs. And it's not just atrazine as well. There are many other chemicals and many other global environmental issues that we need to worry about. Now we have, you know, the, the data now suggests that the average person is exposed to over 300 synthetic chemicals before they leave the womb. And, and you know, these, these chemicals aren't by accident. You know, we've created them because they do things. That's the other thing that people have to understand. We, when we create a pesticide, this is something that is designed to kill something that lives in our same environment, that breathes the same air and drinks the same water that we breathe. So I don't know why people are so surprised that these chemicals then don't turn around and have impacts on us. Because again, I, th I think there's been this feeling that, well, we're separate from all these other things that we're trying to control. And, and when, I, you know, this is sort of off topic, but I'll give an example. Um, glyphosate, Roundup. Roundup works by blocking the, the um, synthesis of key amino acids in plants. These key amino acids are things that are uh, are, are things like phenylalanine and tyrosine and tryptophan. So that's, that's how Roundup kills plants because it stops them from making these amino acids so then they can't make their proteins, right? So it turns out that these amino acids that glyphosate blocks are the essential amino acids for humans. Without plants, if plants can't make them, then we can't get them. No animals can make them. And these Amino acids, tyrosine, tryptophan, and phenylalanine are the basis for things like epinephrine or adrenaline. They're the basis for things like serotonin, which, you know, which is, of course, a neurotransmitter. They're the basis for thyroid hormones, which are required for um, neural development and growth and, and um, mental health. So, so the number one, what's now the number one herbicide in the world blocks, it works by blocking the synthesis of molecules that are essential for all of life. So how can we not think that Roundup's not gonna affect us when we're blocking the plant's ability to make amino acids that we require that plants make those amino acids in order for us to have them in our body. And those amino acids are not just required for our structural proteins, 
they're required for neural signals that allow our you know brain to send signals and and to work and so that's you know that's why i say so why why are we all confused and surprised when we block we're blocking something essential to life why are we surprised that it then impacts our own life in ways that that we don't want it to i don't know there, there are cases for pharmaceuticals and for agrochemicals that I see, oh, okay, I see why, you know, you're, you're bad, like every drug that you take in your body has some, even, even natural compounds, right, has some side effect or some unwanted thing, right, but you balance out, this is giving me more of what I want or need than, than what's harmful. And that I think is the problem, you know, because I, I can think of, I can give you examples of where people have said, should we not use pesticides here? And I think, oh, well, no, I, I kind of see the issue, like, like malaria in East Africa, you know, when you're balancing against you know, my child dying at age two versus potential cancer at an age that you're probably not going to reach in a rural village anyway, right? Then, you know, then it's a hard decision to make. But then there are cases like, um, you know, I see people spraying the weeds that are growing in the cracks in the sidewalk. Like, why, why do you care that there are weeds growing in the cracks in the sidewalk? But things like that that I don't understand. To me, that that benefit doesn't the cost outweighs the benefit in that case. Um, you know, and certainly in my garden, you know, every now and then the aphids, I found what's better is whatever the crop the aphids are on, just let them have that or grow something else for this year, <laughs> you know? So, so, so I think it, it, it's a matter of trying to understand that balance and those cost benefits. Everybody who can make decisions to do so, and, I, and, and we need to make, make it more possible for people to do it should avoid pesticides use and avoid crops or and food products that have been grown with pesticides as much as they could as much as you can buying organic and buying local i think is incredibly important um i always feel a little bit guilty saying that because i live in california where we can get food year round and anywhere we want compared to you know people living in wisconsin for example where there's long winters and things but for as much as we can, eating local and learning how to preserve foods safely, learning how to preserve our crops so that we have food through the winter, back, back like we used to do in the old days, right? I think is incredibly important. And, and I hope, I wish that more people were able to and motivated to do so, to both eat organic or to eat pesticide free, right? Organic doesn't always mean pesticide free, to eat chemical free. Um, I think that would make a huge difference, not only in our personal lives, but also a global difference. The more people who, who adapted those types of practices, the better. You know, we've, we, we humans as a species, we've, we've had a global impact. And that global impact is manifested in climate change, which is a crisis. It's manifested in global chemical contamination. It's manifested in extinction rates. It's manifested now in the global pandemic that that we've contributed to. I, I, and to me, I think the one thing that we can do, and I'm, gonna, I'm trying to phrase this right, the one thing that we can do is to always behave as if we're in an immediate crisis. So one example is when we first moved to California, my wife and I, and there was a drought, there were restrictions. And you, if you walked into a restaurant, they would say, they would ask, would you like water? They wouldn't just pour the water because it was a drought and they were trying to conserve water. But the minute the drought was over, they started pouring water again. And so much water gets wasted. Why don't you continue? That, just that one little thing of asking, do you want water or not, would make a huge difference. And, and I think if we practice the same philosophy, um, as I mentioned earlier with COVID-19, grow vegetables all the time. Don't just grow vegetables when there's a pandemic. Grow your own produce, make your own bread all the time. Um, ask if you want water all the time. And the same with, with the climate change issues. Consider not using your car just to drive down the block. Consider not burning fossil fuels. Consider, um, you know, buying local produce that, that aren't contributing to, in process, contributing to processes that contribute to carbon emissions. Act as if there's a crisis all the time. Don't wait for the science or for somebody else to tell you there's a crisis conserve and preserve all the time as part of your life.